Good morning. This is Faith in Our Hometown, brought to you as a community service and sponsored by Mercy Hospital Joplin. And now, here's your host, Father Jay Friedel. Good morning and welcome or welcome back to Faith in Our Hometown, a weekly discussion about matters of faith that kind of crisscross our lives here as people living in the greater Joplin area. Uh, we're so glad you joined us again for another Sunday morning. My guest this morning is Marge Boudreau, who is the executive director of uh, NALA, which is the Neighborhood Adult Literacy Action Group, or as they usually respond or refer to it as NALA Read, because as Marge told me before we get started, most people don't even know what NALA is. <laughs> but it's our, our local literacy organization. So how do we help people to improve their lives by being able to read and to write and to do those things? Uh, and so she's going to be talking a little bit about what that organization does and how we can help some of our brothers and sisters, or actually all of them, to help you know, engage them in the community and why that's so important. So we're going to be right back after this Mercy Minute. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning. Don't go away. We're going to be right back with Nayla in just a moment. From childhood, whenever I was about 12, I would say um, my weight really started climbing and it, it never really plateaued. I've tried low carb diets, high protein diets, I've tried calorie diets. It's very important to Dr. Lou that um, this is a team effort so, so it, um, a primary care doctor following up with me regularly and the dietitian was very helpful on providing recipes and, and helpful information to help me be successful in my journey. I am very active and I play sports with the kids. We like to go play volleyball. I've done some warrior dashes. Well, again, thanks for joining us for another Sunday morning for Faith in Our Hometown. My guest this morning is Marge Boudreau, uh, who's the executive director of NALA, or the Neighborhood Adult Literacy Action Group. So, Marge, tell us a little bit about yourself and then tell us a little bit about NALA. All right. Well, I just uh, <coughs> celebrated, my husband and I just celebrated our 60th wedding anniversary. Congratulations. And uh, we have five children, 12 grandchildren and two great-grandchildren, so we're very proud of all of them. Good for them. So besides working at NALA, I enjoy myself with, with my family a great deal. Good, good, good. How long have you been in the Joplin area? Actually, uh, most recently for 21 years. Okay. Uh, no, 31 years. 31 years. 31 years, but then I went to school here at Ozark Bible College okay. and then came back. Uh, when we were on furlough, we would come back and live here for a while, so I probably spent maybe 40 years of my life in Joplin. Good. But well, I'm really from Nebraska. That's okay. That's okay. That's, that's, that's all in this big <laughs> big Midwest, we call it. That's okay? true. So how did you get involved with NALA, and what does NALA do? All right. Uh, <clears throat> well, first of all, I had friends on the board of Joplin NALA Reed, and they came to me and said, the coordinator's leaving. We'd like for you to apply for the job. And I thought, why would I do that? <laughs> I teach at Southern a little bit, adjunct. Mm -hmm. And uh, why would I want to do that? So uh, I didn't pursue it right away. And on a trip back from Texas, I don't often say things like this, but it really was like the Lord. <laughs> Somebody spoke to me in it's my okay. mind. It's okay, we call this faith in our hometown. It's I okay, know. you can talk about can the talk Lord about here faith. a little bit. Yeah, it's really, it's okay. Uh, at least I had the impression in my mind mm -hmm. that I needed sure. to go and apply for this job, definitely. Mm -hmm. I went and applied, the coordinator said, you're too late. I said. Okay. There you go. Okay, there you go. She said, well, you're here. Fill it out anyway. <laughs> so I filled it out. <laughs> okay. And so there, there was reluctance all the way, which is kind of, kind of amazing. And when I finally uh, went for my interview, I had already uh, agreed to teach at Southern again, adjunct. And so I thought, they're not going to want me because they want a full-time director. <clears throat> so I was very casual and relaxed at my interview, and uh, they came back and offered me the job. Well, there you go. And said, you're the only one who talked about education. You're the only one who smiled during the interview <laughs> and laughed and uh, was passionate about education. Well, and good. I am about learning. So I started there in August of 1994. You know, I, I don't know sometimes, I think that for 
for those of us who've been blessed, and this is what I always tell my students, when you are educated and when you have an education, because I've been doing campus ministry now for 20, you know, 23, 24 years. Uh -huh. And I always just tell my students, you will never be among the poorest of the poor because you have your education. Right. You have a voice. You can speak. You're not, <coughs> you're not trapped, um, you know, anywhere because uh, you're, you're literate. <laughs> <coughs> and you can do those things. You know? Somebody asked me today, um, what difference does it make whether people can read and write and, and do English, speak English well? And I said, <coughs> well, a lot, of, a lot of intelligences you're not asked to. I have never been asked to show that I can change a tire or that I can conduct a symphony or that I can uh, read schematic drawings. But everyone expects an adult to be able to read and write and speak their own language. Right. And when you can't do that, you, you don't have access to the options that, <coughs> that you should have as an adult. Well, well, right. you're, and, you're, and again, some folks, through, and again, through no fault of their own, right. you know, is this find that difficult or didn't, didn't, you know, you know, didn't, I mean, I've heard stories about people that made it all the way through grade school and nobody ever figured out that they didn't know how to read. I, we have a book that says the teacher who couldn't read, he made it through college. He was teaching school before he, his, te his wife found out he couldn't read. He was so smart that he knew how to cheat and he knew how to use his students to keep track of all of his records. And he said, there's always one student in the class that knows how to spell. So when the other students put words on the board, I'd say, okay, were those words right? And the smart student would say, no, that's spelled wrong. Uh -huh. and, and so he used other things. And finally, uh, I don't know, at the age of 40 or so, he finally learned to read. Which and is, it was yeah. a, a, just amazing. You know, and it is. I mean, you know, and I, and I just, uh, you know, I think that the time, uh, I would hope that any, anybody that's out there who's not, who's been hiding that fact, there's help for you. Yeah, that There's really help is. for you to be able to, you know, to break through and to do that. I mean, it's no, I don't, I, I don't think it should be a thing of shame. I mean, you know, right. if you don't know, you don't know. And, and, you know, but there are people out here like Nayla who can help, That's which right. is a wonderful thing. Which is what we want people to know. We had a young man uh, who actually sent his wife to get some reading materials because he said he needed to improve his reading. She came back and said, well, these didn't really help him much. So we thought, well, okay. We hadn't met the young man yet. So next he came in and said, uh, I'm just looking here to see if a friend of mine might uh, need to go here. And uh, he just asked a few questions, left again. About six months after the initial uh, observation where his wife came in, he came back and sat down and said, I need help. Mm -hmm. And he's been a fantastic student. He's, he had a good job. He was very sure. able to talk. He just couldn't read at the level that he wanted to. He could read some, but he couldn't read at the level he wanted to. And so we provide one-on-one -on -one tutoring for people like that. Mm -hmm. And she's helped him go from a fifth grade level through to a high school level. And he's probably reading now as fluently as he wants to. Good. Well, you know, I love stories like that. So, so what kind of, uh, you know, uh, it's anybody who can't. Uh, anybody who's in our area who can, and for whatever reason. So I know you help all different groups and types of people. Yes, so you want to talk about that a little bit? Right. Uh, <clears throat> we feel that our mission is to enable every adult to reach their full potential as a learner. Mm -hmm. So that means uh, I work with a de developmentally challenged young man mm -hmm. who started out reading below a first grade level. He now reads above a second grade level. He may never read at a fifth grade level, but he's improved where he is. He can read stories and enjoy them, and we can laugh and talk about them. And it's, it enriches your life to be able to read and to read about other people. And so we help people at that level. We help people who <coughs> are here getting their high school equivalency because we work with the Adult Education and Literacy Program, which formerly GED, right. but now they call it the high set. Um, so we work with them so we may have students who are 10th grade readers, but maybe fifth grade in math. And so we even help with math. Okay. Our biggest population is the English as a second language students. We have 16 to 18 students that come every morning from nine to 11, uh, almost without fail, to classes that we have for them. The students who are trying to improve their reading, we provide a tutor one-on-one -on -one for them because it's hard 
to know where they are. Sure. And it's hard to know where they English is second language, but they work well in a class setting. And so we can put them in classes and uh, improve their English in reading, listening, speaking, writing. So yeah. that, that we work with that too. And it's, it's just exciting to work with these students. Well, I remember even sitting as a second grader with my aunt at the table. My aunt had, I don't know that she was never, I mean, this is, I mean, you know, uh, I'm 56, and so my aunt's probably 20 years older than I am. So, um, you know, but I remember at that point in time, and it was before I knew there were such things as, um, you know, uh, learning disabilities, mm, you know. Right, right. And, and, and I could just tell that she couldn't, there were certain things that she couldn't, get past. Uh -huh. And um, I remember saying to my mom, who was an educator, um, you know, what's wrong with, you know, uh, Aunt Mary? She can't always, you know, get those things. But she was trying so hard. And I just remember, you know, when we had those little breakthroughs, how, how excited mm -hmm. she was about, you know, figuring something out that she hadn't figured out before. And, right. you know, and again, it, for me, it, it didn't seem to be a big deal. But for her, that to have that little breakthrough to do that was just really kind of neat and exciting. And I learned that at a very early age, that it was just like that everybody learns differently. Yes. And everybody has different abilities. That's you know, true. there are certain things she can do that I still, she's, she's one of the few people in the world that I know is a better cook than I am, mm. you know? Mm -hmm. But by golly, she is, and she yeah. always has been. And for her, you know, uh, she's better able to read those recipes now than she mm -hmm. was before. And mm -hmm. God love her, you know, she's able to do that and to do mm -hmm. some of those things. But some of those things that were a challenge, uh, she just continued to work and work and work, and God love her because, I mean, you know, now she's again able to do what she wants to right. do. But I know that she struggled in her younger life to right. be able to do that. We, th we think that <clears throat> probably many of the adults who come to us who don't read well uh, at a later age probably have some form of dyslexia or learning disability. That just means that their intelligence is higher than their reading and writing ability would lead you to believe. Right. So they read at a lower level than, than they should from their intelligence level. We think that the materials that we use help them uh, as much as anything and the one-on-one -on -one situation helps them because they get the individual attention. Uh, the uh, material that we use is a um, uh, for the low-level reader is a very structured system where they, they actually learn words which are put into a, a story immediately. So they're reading both, they're having both a phonics approach mm -hmm. and a whole language approach right away, which we think is very helpful. And they have success. We don't tell the student, well, sound it out at the beginning. We're teaching them the sounds and names of letters if they need that. Mm -hmm. And when they're reading the story, we might read the first sentence and then let them read the rest. These are not really the most interesting stories in the world. They're like, this is a girl, this is a bird, this is a cup, this is a dish. But if you've never read before, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's pretty exciting. And, and the repetition helps them, which is good for d dyslexic people. Yeah. Well, we're talking here today with Marge Boudreau, uh, who is the Executive Director of the Neighborhood Adult Literacy Action Group, or NALA is known here in our area. And we're just talking about uh, how we can kind of improve the lot of all of the folks in our, our population uh, that they can read to the level that they want to be able to read. So uh, we're going to be right back after a short break. Uh, please don't go away. Stick with us, and we'll be right back with you in just a second. <laughs> I didn't get that single word. You're watching Faith in Our Hometown on KSN TV, brought to you as a community service and sponsored by Mercy Hospital Joplin. So thanks for sticking with us this morning. As I mentioned before the break, uh, our guest, Marge uh, Boudreau, uh, who works with the Literacy Organization. So Marge, um, you work with all kinds of different populations and you've talked a little bit about your techniques. Um, what else might we not know about your organization? Well, there's a, there's a system when the, when the student first comes to us, they go mm -hmm. through an orientation so that we can tell them a little bit about us. Right. And we give them an assessment so that we know where they are, whether they're reading, having reading, uh, an American having reading difficulties or someone uh, learning English as their second or third language. So we give them that assessment. Uh, we introduce them to the uh, 
to the building, we talked to them about some commitments that we asked them to make. Mm -hmm. uh, since they receive their services free of charge, we do not charge anything for materials or for our services. Right. We asked them to make a commitment to come when they have said they would. If they're meeting with a tutor, for instance, that time is very uh, important because the tutor may have to drive across town to get there. Sure. And so the student, we ask the student to make the commitment to let us know if they're not going to be there or the tutor also. And uh, if they're in classes, we ask them to come to class or let us know if they can't make it. Uh, so we have that kind of a um, beginning for them. But most of all, I think we welcome them, make them feel welcome uh, very, very much. Even though we have certain orientation they have to go through, sign-in sheets, they have to sign their name and then time they come and time they leave. That's for our documentation sure. so that we know uh, what, <coughs> who's been there. But uh, most of all, we want them to feel safe. And I was talking with some of my board members today and they said, when, when I see the students file out, they're smiling, they're, they're happy, they look like they've had a good time, and they, they'll come into my office and talk to me if they want to. Uh, they feel like this is a comfortable place of learning. Mm -hmm. And as a <clears throat> side issue, I had one couple, tutor and student, and I noticed when they came out of their room, they were both unhappy, frowning, kind of non, non, uh, didn't want to speak to me. So I talked to them about it talk individually <laughs> and decide, uh, decided that maybe that wasn't a good match because we try to match them. Sure. Availability of time, of course, but also who we think will work with somebody. And we just decided that that was not a good match. Just wasn't a good matchup, sure. And, uh, the <clears throat> actually the tutor decided to leave and that was probably a good good solution for it i didn't have to make an abrupt change and uh, we got the student back with someone else that he felt more comfortable with oh. so that doesn't happen very often but no uh, we do but let's it. face it we've all had in our lives the teachers that we loved and the teachers we struggled with and <laughs> right. i mean and that's the that's the reality right. for for all of us. I love the fact that you teach, you know, that you just take everybody and you help assess them when they come in because, you know, again, uh, you know, somebody presents himself as, you know, very bright, very, very competent. You can tell they're extremely intelligent. Uh, but then when you start helping work with them, you know, you, the, and they start telling you the truth, uh, you know, they find that their reading level might not match all the rest of that intelligence. So all mm -hmm. you're really doing is filling that gap, right? you know, and helping them reach where they want to reach. Um, and I have a story to tell about that. Uh, I still remember this older woman who came in and, and I did a quick assessment. Uh, she was reading, I think, at an eighth grade level, which was, I thought, marvelous in our book. And uh, she was standing in front of me and I said to her, it's amazing, you're very intelligent. She looked behind her to see who I was talking to. Right. Because she had never had anybody Tell her, tell her she, she was, was intelligent. intelligent before. And I said, I said, no, I'm talking to you. And then I started asking her, how did you, uh, how did you learn to read? She said, I don't have many books at my house. I read the dictionary. And I thought, my word, if I had to, if I had to read the dictionary and learn to read, I'd probably still be oh, uh, I mean, that would a non-reader. <laughs> so this woman was, was uh, extremely competent and able to learn. Yeah, but she'd never been but given had, some of the right tools or the right, right. tricks, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, in terms of your percentages. So, so are the are the largest bulk of your people English as a second language? About seventy percent. Okay. Uh, we typically in a year we have may have uh, around one hundred and ninety go through our uh, everything. Wow, that's a lot. Right, uh, yeah. but at any given time, uh, the ratio is more like seventy around seventy students that are coming through, okay. and so two thirds of them will be uh, English as a second language. And, and then least. after that, what is your next largest group, do you think? I mean, just in terms of, you know, a, a grouping. Well, maybe the developmentally <coughs> challenged. We okay. do have, we have some special classes, a couple of special classes for them, besides the one I teach. Um, <coughs> and, uh, but, well, no, I would say the next, sorry, that, that's probably not right. The next largest group is the people we help from the adult education and literacy program that are trying to get their high school equivalency okay. exam. Because we work mostly we have more people in that section that come over 
when they go to a adult education and literacy to register for their uh, used to be GED exam, they're assessed also. And if they read at a fourth grade level, they can't do the work to prepare for their right. high school. Much too challenging, so they, yeah. the director comes t and talks to me and, s and asks me for a tutor. If they're doing math at a fifth grade level, they need some help with, from us before they can actually do the math that, that will uh, enable them to pass. Sure. Right. So we work, a great many of our students are from that section, and then we do have the uh, lower level that come from different group homes, and we put them in classes or with a tutor. So we have different, different levels. Oh, good. So, I mean, you're even, you're even helping some folks that many times other people might have even written off. Yes. Uh, you're helping them to have a better quality of life because they're able to read what they want to read and to do right. those things. I'm very proud That's of exciting. the student I work with because for him to be able to read a story about uh, uh, someone in, a, in uh, Washington, D.C. who drives a taxi and, <clears throat> and understand it and, and react to it, it it's exciting. Yeah. when he couldn't read when he started. Yeah, well that's, that is exciting to see the difference. You know, I, I know that, um, uh, I remember way back when I was in kindergarten when we were starting to learn how to read, you know, and we were reading, you know, things on the board, mm -hmm. and I remember suddenly all those little marks that I could see on paper, and I remember suddenly, you know, my little brain working to say, you know, how does that, oh my gosh, those are words. <laughs> oh my gosh, you know, and then, I remember driving along with my mom and dad and you know, because I was learning to sound out words and to do all those things and you know and again the white signs that say path pass with care we had a white station wagon in the at the time and I remember I remember saying to myself why do all those signs say pass the white car oh you know and it was just like and I <laughs> remember really that pretty good. I know it was pretty good that I mean you know my mom good. was like honey what's it tell me when the sign comes up again and she saw it and she went oh okay no that doesn't say pass the white car <laughs> but you know I was doing that was my little kindergarten brain trying right. to make sense out of the world right. you know at that point in time and and you know and again and I when I it just kind of like when other folks you know can't do that or didn't have you know the maybe the teachers that I did or the opportunities that I did I mean it's kind of exciting that you get you get the opportunity to do that yeah. with people or even when they come and join in a different culture yes you yes. know uh, it where is. it's just like you know maybe they were again very intelligent but didn't have any formal education or training mm -hmm. and now they're here because uh, their world got turned upside down somewhere else and now they're here yes. and they're trying to figure out how to do that in this in this area right we had a <clears throat> young woman come from uh, one of the Central American countries who had never gone to school, not even in, so couldn't even read her own language. Wow, yeah. Um, but she stuck with us and uh, improved her reading to the place where she, uh, she actually was able to, she came with a green card so she had no trouble getting a job, but she couldn't read well enough when she started. Right. She got a job, got a car, got an apartment. I mean, just made her way because she's able to read and she is still coming to us because she wants to improve. She wants to do more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think that that's so interesting because again, uh, we, we take so many things for granted here in the United States, our educational system and you know, that every kid that really wants to go to school, you know, is allowed to and can. Mm -hmm. And there are just so many people in other parts of the world that there's not even a school, you know, mm -hmm. or, you know, they live in a mountain village and, you know, and uh, they, there was never school available. Right. Or that they were helping, you know, make money for their family That's, and so they had to quit when they were yeah. little or whatever. That was, that was her problem. Yeah. She was kept at home. So that she could help raise money for the, for the rest of the family yeah. to be supported. You know, and again, all those noble things and, and people do what they need to do to cope through the years. Right. But I think that it's really important that now that they're learning how to cope by coming to somebody like you and saying, you know, help me to, help me to improve my life, help me to reach my full potential. Right. You know, and help it's, me to it's read. It's kind of exciting in our classroom because we have uh, <coughs> students from such different countries. We have someone now from Uzbekistan. We have Saudi Arabia, uh, India, um, of course, Hispanics from various places, oh, yeah. Venezuela, Colombia, uh, as well as Central America, Brazil. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and Japanese, 
Korean. So it, it's interesting to have all of these people in the same classroom. They do have to speak English, though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the teacher, little, is, yeah. the teacher does not. Some people have a mistaken idea that if you teach English as a second language, you have to know the other person's language, and you don't. Yeah. No, it is, uh, you know. I mean, as, I, as I'm fond of saying, I'm illiterate in several languages. <laughs> oh, I definitely you know? am. <laughs> I'm definitely illiterate in several languages. Uh, so we're here talking with Marge Boudreau, who's the, uh, who's the executive director of NALA, or the Neighborhood Adult Literacy Action Program. And we, uh, we're going to be, uh, uh, I will say, if you want to volunteer, okay, 417-782-2646. Uh, 417-782-2646 and at joplinnayla.org. We're going to be right back uh, after this Mercy Minute. Don't go away because we're going to come back and wrap up and talk a little bit about again what you can do to help. how a Mercy doctor can take care of you. At Mercy, your life is our life's work. Quality, safety, and an exceptional patient experience. Mercy is grateful to be recognized as one of the top 15 health systems in the United States. At Mercy, your life is our life's work. Well, again, thank you for joining us for another Sunday Morning for Faith in our hometown. We've been talking about adult literacy with the executive director of NELA here that works with that group, Marge Boudreau. So, Marge, thank you for joining us. Uh, Marge wanted me to make sure that any of you that might be interested in volunteering, uh, there's going to be a workshop on September 23rd. It's a tutor training workshop. So if you are interested, you can call the number that's there on the screen uh, and contact them uh, and, uh, and maybe start making a difference in somebody else's life. I think that sometimes we think that there's nothing we can do to help other people. And uh, sometimes it's very simple. Uh, it's, it's reaching out and taking an interest in somebody else's life and taking something that we take for granted that we know how to do, that we might be able to spend that time with somebody else making a huge difference uh, in the quality of their life, helping them to reach their full potential. Uh, and that's of course what literacy and literacy advocacy is all about, right. is helping people to reach their full potential. So again, we thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for caring about the issues here uh, across our area and all of our brothers and sisters out there who might need a little bit of extra assist. Uh, join us next week for Faith in Our Hometown. God bless you and you have a great week. Thanks for watching. Faith in Our Hometown can be seen Sunday mornings at 6.30 and 9 a.m. on KSN. Brought to you as a community service and sponsored by Mercy Hospital Joplin.